and uh, the title of our message is Outward and Inward and Upward because here is another, if you like, three-point sermon provided for us by the Apostle Paul in this 11th verse. Not slothful in business, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord. Now chapter 12 of Paul's letter to the Romans, as we've seen, turns from the doctrine to the application of the doctrine. From the glorious truths of the first 11 chapters to the living of the spiritual and the Christian life. And we've seen verse 1, I beseech you therefore brethren by the mercies of God that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice wholly acceptable unto God which is your reasonable service. To be reminded of that first verse is an essential understanding for the whole chapter. I beseech you by the mercies of God, the wonderful things that he's done for us as believers, that you present, that is offer as an act of worship, your bodies a living sacrifice. So we saw there are two departments of worship, two kinds of worship. There is direct worship, such as that, that we are engaged in, in this service. And then there is the offering as a living sacrifice of the body. And the word body stands here for the whole life. All our faculties and powers and time, everything that is ours. And the chapter will work this out. And be not conformed to this world, shaped by it, fashioned by it, as so many, alas, even Christians allow themselves to be in these days. But be ye transformed from within, that is, by the renewing of your mind. And we looked at some of these verses. And there is from verses 3 to 8, some of the spiritual gifts that go on. And uh, we studied them. And then that ninth verse let love be without dissimulation, pretense, abhor that which is evil, cleave to that which is good. And the tenth verse about relationships, and the eleventh verse that we'll look at is about active Christian living. And the twelfth verse is how we react to circumstances. And the thirteenth verse is about compassion and hospitality. And the fourteenth verse is about persecution and how we respond to it. And then verse fifteen is about empathy and so on. So every verse is of great importance. And the eleventh verse, which is our business today, not slothful in business, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord. So the first point that I'd like to raise from this 11th verse is this. It's the outward attitude and behavior of the believer. What we do, our manner as Christians, not slothful in business, not slow, hesitant, indolent, some translated along these lines, do not lag behind in business. We'll come to business in a moment. Not slothful in business. And the word business there, well, actually, the King James Version selects the best word to translate the Greek if only we pronounce it in the right way. It has nothing to do, or not much to do, with business in the sense of commerce, it's not not slothful in your business life. But if we pronounce it differently, you get the sense of the word. Not slothful in busyness. Now that's much better represents the Greek, and that's what the King James translators no doubt intended in their day. The Greek word translated business there mean, is re really comes from speed. It means not slothful in eagerness, not slothful in forwardness, not slothful in zeal. Actually, 
the apostles' words are rather strange. You can boil them down to this. Be not slow in speed. That's one way, but not the best way of translating the Greek. Be not slow in speed. Well, what he means, quite plainly, is do not be slow in forwardness as a manner, as an attitude. And that's what I'd like to talk on in this first point, just for a few minutes. Do not be slow in your uh, forwardness, in living the Christian life, in living for him, and in all that you do. This first point will be rather physical, rather earthly, and yet not entirely. And the second point, in verse 11, fervent in spirit, goes on to deal with the spiritual side of matters. Think of the Lord. You read the New Testament. You can't help but see how much he was doing, always traveling, preaching everywhere, healing, not dozens, not hundreds, but thousands, and sometimes perhaps tens of thousands. You think of all the passages which tell us that in such and such a place he healed all those who were sick or infirm or possessed. Always healing, always laboring, always then teaching his disciples and the references to his praying. So when you think of Christ, though uh, we have no insight into, say, his human personality, Nevertheless, you can see he's always applied to things, always flowing outwards to people, always busy. He was not slow, dare we say it respectfully, in busyness, constantly applying himself. The Apostle Paul also. You cannot read the book of Acts without wondering how a man who was elderly for the day and sick could accomplish so much with all the opposition he sustained, all the difficulties and impediments, again all the travelling, all the risks that were taken, all the preaching, all that was to be done. It's a constant picture of action and movement. And you think of the other apostles too, as they spread the word. And you think of the early Christians. You think of those who had quite nice uh, uh, jobs to do. They were uh, craftsmen. They were skilled. They did complex work. But in order to do that in the Gentile work, you had, world, you had to belong to a trade guild. And those trade guilds were idolatrous. And you had to go to the idol feasts. And so the Christians left the trade guilds. And that meant they had to do the most menial and labouring work. Of course, many were slaves anyway. We appreciate that. And you think of the activity as they were at the same time participants in this great spreading of the word in the ancient world. And you think of today... It's amazing today we have lethargic Christianity on every hand where most of the activity in the churches at large from what we can see is involved in their being entertained. Massive industry among Christians, so-called Christians even, of bands and means of entertainment. But lethargic, the average Christian with regard to serving the Lord. But now, this is the, the exhortation here in verse 11. Not slothful, not hesitant, not reluctant, not slow to be forward, outgoing, active, involved in the Lord's work and in the spreading of the gospel. Not slothful in business. It isn't the case today. Now, it's true that many people live exceptionally busy lives. We appreciate that, we realise that, but yet at the same time, so often, we do not make this outgoing, applied, busy aspect of Christian living a part of our programme. For instance, 
We examine ourselves, and so we should regularly for sin. We say, what have I omitted to do today? Or what have I done today or been lured into which I should not have been into? What have I said which has been hurtful, unkind, or unreasonable? We review our hearts. Have I been selfish or this or that? And do we include in our review, what have I done which is good? Put aside the matter of uh, obvious sin for the moment. What are my aims? What have I planned to do? Have I lived to myself? Have I lived only for this present world? What am I doing? What have I... Do we include this forwardness to apply ourselves to all manner of things? Do we have targets, self-watch, discipline that covers how we live altogether? Forwardness in worship. Who was late this morning? Now I know there are unprecedented traffic difficulties at the present time and a crazy digging up of every other road and all sorts of things being rushed through. And one goes out on the road on a Sunday morning and lo and behold another road's being closed or another lane isn't working and there are hold-ups and so on. I appreciate all that. But it's not just now. It's, it's quite frequently that people are late. Is that forward in worship? Keen? From the very beginning to be here, so in worship, in prayerfulness, when we hear of needs and difficulties, when we know there are great concerns, are we among the first, privately, personally, to bring these things before the Lord? Forward in witness, are we always on the watch, taking opportunities as they arise, ready to look for them patiently? Are we forward in friendliness to other people or do we in that respect live to ourselves? We wait for friendliness to come to us. We are not forward. Are we forward in helpfulness and of course in specific acts of Christian service in the home, in the family to help? Sometimes I've heard of cases where the most seemingly spiritual and dedicated and committed member of the family is the laziest and the least involved in the ordinary life of home and the work and the things that need to be done. And that's a sad thing. Are we forward in our lives to help, to take our part and so on and respond to needs? Are we forward in apology and peacemaking when the need arises? Are we forward in trying the spirits, testing the new trends and things which come into the churches? If only all office bearers worldwide in churches were forward in testing the spirits, then churches wouldn't go off at crazy angles all the time. Well, this is the Apostles' exhortation not slothful in business. Now, of course, this operates within personality. Sometimes there are people who, they are replied, they are busy, they, they are forward in coming to help in different things. And this is not a criticism of them, but such is their personality that it's all done with fire and thunder. And I don't mean in the wrong way. It's evident that that person is busy. And yet there are other people who somehow fit it all into a quiet temperament. It's how we're made. And you see them doing something and it's done with absolutely no fuss. It's almost imperceptible. You don't realise they've got everything in hand and all sorts of things on the go and covered. So there's this variation within personality. If you're a quiet or controlled or very quietly capable person or you're a very visibly busy person, that doesn't matter. That's sometimes how we're made. It's how we are. The 
question is, are we forward and outgoing? Do we look at ourselves and say, well, yes, I've thought up till now that the important thing is my spiritual life. But here, under the inspiration of the Spirit of God, the Apostle Paul tells me, I am to be an applied, watchful, noticing needs, forward, outgoing person. Obviously, according to the manner of my own personality. But I must be checking myself for this. And sometimes in growing up, the teenagers who have the most energy in one way, they're used to being provided for at home, catered for, waited on, everything done. And some, more slowly than others, pass that mile post when they're supposed to be contributing or helping or doing it. And uh, parents wait for that, sometimes a long time, from to change from children into young adults. Have we changed? Have we changed in the church? Or do we only sit in the pew and wait for it all to come to us? Now this is not a person saying these things, it's the Apostle Paul. It's part of your Christian life to be an outgoing, an applied, and a busy person. And so the Apostle says, not slothful, not slow, not hanging behind, not reluctant, not hesitant to be busy, to have speed, as it were, to be zealous, to notice things, to be applied to things. So put it on your self-watch list. What, how am I living? At home, in church, and so on. So I now proceed to the second point, not slothful in business, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord. Fervent in spirit. The Greek is to be heated, but not heated in terms of losing one's temper. The application is, if it's a fluid, it means to be boiling. If it's a solid, it means to be glowing, like embers, hot coals, or molten metal. So, some people translate this, be a glow with the spirit, assuming that a solid condition is in mind. But in any way, it means be heated to boiling point or glowing point in spirit. And this is our second point. It's translated here fervent, as it is in Acts 18, verse 25. Now this is not to be read as the root or the means of fulfilling the first phrase, not slothful in business. I'm not saying be fervent in spirit and then you will be busy. Because actually that doesn't follow. The sad thing is there are people who are fervent in spirit but they don't pull their weight physically. It's possible for us to get one right without the other. And there are certainly people who pull their weight physically but they allow the spirit to grow cool. And their spiritual life is not as it should be. And of course, one is no use without the other. And so the apostle puts them in different departments. Consider your manner as an outward, noticing, coming to the help kind of person. And then consider your spiritual life also, in order to be both, in order to be aglow with the spirit. Now, in Acts 6, for example, we read of Stephen one of the first deacons and the first martyr, that he was full of faith and of the Holy Ghost. Well, the question is, how did they know? How did the church members know that he was full of the Holy Spirit? Well, we may assume they knew from his conversation. Not that he always spoke about spiritual things, he may have done, but he spoke often about spiritual things and they knew he was a spiritual man. 
They knew from the way he encouraged them. They knew from his humility. Because it takes the Holy Spirit to make a man or a woman truly humble. And they knew he was a spiritual man. They knew from his alertness to souls and to spiritual issues that he was a spiritual man, full of the Holy Spirit. They saw it in his conscientiousness too, the way he would apply himself to every task he was given, his trustworthiness, and above all, in his love for Christ. So it was evident. Today, people want to some other kind of signal. They want tongues which have passed for today. How else can we see, they say, if anyone is filled with the Spirit? Well, from all the kind of things that I've mentioned. You see, the filling of the Spirit doesn't lead to a light bulb going on on top of your head. Or like uh, we've seen in some countries where they fit a, an amber light to the top of a commercial vehicle and also a flashing light on the dash panel and sometimes even a buzzer and every time that commercial vehicle exceeds the speed limit which is set to it everything goes off, the buzzer, the light on the dash panel and the light on the top and you can drive behind a vehicle and see his lights flashing and everybody and the nearest policeman that he's exceeding the speed limit well I'm often fascinated seeing that. But anyway, it's not like that. The, the evidence of the filling of the Spirit is the things that I've been listing. And that's what they saw in Stephen. So they knew he was a spiritual man. He had concern for the glory of God and the advance of the kingdom and prayer and learning of the things of God. He was concerned for sanctification and the filling of the Spirit brings instrumentality. Not slothful in business, fervent in spirit. So we watch our manner of life, how outgoing we are, how busy we are and helpful we are and active. We're not sitting by and watching and we watch our spiritual lives. What is my prayer life like? Am I ma maintaining my ministry of intercession in prayer? Am I examining my heart regularly? Am I pledging myself to the Lord and seeking his help in the walk of righteousness? Am I fervent in spirit? So three things, not slothful in business or busyness, fervent in in spirit and serving the Lord. So outward living, inward living, and this final serving the Lord, upward living, serving the Lord. It's not the same word for service or serving as you get at the end of verse 1, which is your reasonable service to give your whole life, your body, your faculties and offering to God is your logical, rational, reasonable worship is in mind in verse 1. Service is a menial service word which is most often applied in the New Testament to worship. But in verse 11 it's different. Serving the Lord is the slave servant word. And the idea is, as one who is in the bond service of the Lord. So we have to watch our outward manner and busyness, not slothful in business. We have to watch our spiritual life, that it's a glow, fervent in spirit. And we have to see ourselves as those who are the bond slaves, bond servants, the property belong to the Lord serving the Lord as a servant. And this is full of meaning. We live as people bound to Christ. We live as people owned by him and submissive to him. It isn't always the case. In the Christian world, you read of some people and 
They have maybe their very prominent celebrity pastors, and I don't want to generalize or speak of everybody, but it's pretty obvious you can see some. Their performance is so theatrical, the way they go about things, it's such a massive demonstration of exhibitionism and drawing attention to themselves. Well, and the things they do and the innovations they bring in, anything that might be calculated to increase the prosperity or the noticeability of their church or their own personal ministry, whether it's in the Bible or not. And you can see what's going wrong from this verse. Uh, they're not slothful in the way they go about things, whether they're fer really fervent in spirit, we can't see. But they don't seem to be doing it for the Lord. They seem to be doing it for themselves. They are become so noticeable, so celebrity. They even hire professional people to polish their image and to sh advise them on how they can maintain this noticeability and so on. Whereas we're told, busy, not slothful in business, fervent in spirit, true devotion and love for Christ, and as people who are his servants. We're only servants. Busy as we are, we're only servants. And we must stick to taking his instructions and following the bidding of his word. And we must do everything, not for us, but for him. Not in the way that will attract attention to us, but will bring glory to his name. In fact, let me turn to Matthew 6 and the words of Christ for a few moments from verse 16. Moreover, says Christ, when ye fast, be not as the hypocrites of a sad, sad countenance, for they disfigure their faces that they may appear unto men to fast. Listen to these words. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. They have their reward. What does the Lord mean? Well, they're noticed by the people who respect that kind of thing. They're respected. People think well of them. People say, what spiritual men these are. How close they are to the Lord. And they admire them. And so, says Christ, they've had their reward. The reward they wanted was to be noticed. The reward they wanted was to be significant in the eyes of men and to be valued by men. And they've got it. They are not getting a reward from me, he implies. They are not getting anything from heaven because they've had the reward they sought, which was entirely on earth. They did it for appearances. Now we go back to Romans chapter 12 and verse 11, the end of the verse, serving the Lord, that is slaves to the Lord, bound to the Lord as servants who belong, who are watching out only for his interests and are doing everything for him. This, for example, is why we never, never, never in the Church of Christ, we never applaud anyone. There's only one exception in this church. There's only one time when we applaud, and that is at School of Theology, when we applaud the caterers for all their care of us through those few days. But we never applaud anyone for anything directly spiritual. Never. That's not only unwise, it's not only misplaced, dare I say, by the standards of the Bible, it is sinful. A service of worship in which people are applauded, we are throwing the word of God back in the Lord's face. Ah, Lord, 
You say we must do everything for thee. Thine is the glory. No, we're not having that. We want glory on earth. We want appreciation now. We want to admire people. We never, ever applaud in spiritual things. And we never accept applause or praise of men in that way. You, it's hard to keep out of Christian circles. Sometimes people write biographies which go far beyond encouraging our hearts by showing us the lives and the spiritual progress which has been made by certain people so as to glorify God, but naked admiration of the person and praise of the person. And the biographer is not a has forgotten his trade as a spiritual biographer. No applause for people, dear friends. And people, they actually bow to an audience in church, which is the symbolism of receiving their praise and their adoration. Never in church. Oh, yes. If you are uh, skilled at something and people in the world and people want to implore, applaud you, that's their business and your business. But not in church. It's all for the Lord. Upward reliance. He comes first. He gets all the credit and all the glory. And I mean it, friends. He is our greatest interest. We have no interest in the world greater than the interest that we have in him. He is our aim. He is our goal, the end point of our lives. He is our highest authority. He is the one who gives us all the directions, Christ, our Lord and Saviour. He is our destiny. He is our happiness. He is everything to us and we owe him all. He came to Calvary to purchase us for eternal glory. We owe him everything. We say, my life is for him, not for me, not for notice. My Lord's day is for him. Is your Lord's day for him? I read an awful book recently from a seminary professor in the United States the title was Suspicious, Becoming Worldly Saints. And it almost uh, spelled it out. Oh, you must honour the Lord's day, he says, in the morning, that is, when you go to church. And then he gives people liberty pretty well to do what they like. No, when the Lord is truly your Lord, you say, my Lord's day is for him. All of it so far as I can possibly make it. He is my pleasure, my pleasure is in him. My strength and my consolation is from him. He is my example and my inspiration, my guidance, my all. So you're a servant in the pay, as it were, in the ownership of the Lord your God. So this is our thinking this morning, and I want to keep matters simple and brief. Not slothful, lagging behind, slow, in busyness. Watch your outward activity towards other people and your family and the unsaved and the church. Fervent in spirit, a glow, always checking your spiritual fervour and serving as a lowly bond slave, the Lord, and he is everything and all the glory. Outwardly, the outflowing life, inwardly, checking our relationship with the Lord and upwardly doing all for him. That's the Apostles' three-point sermon in verse 11 of Romans 12. May bless it to all our hearts.